It's Markets with May, and today is Friday, and it is another exciting day in the marketplace. Hey, Dr. A, how are you doing, Arnold? Um, okay, so as we always mention, past performance is not indicative of future returns, um, and um, wow, but this market is so exciting. I think um, every day is just such a different moment, so to speak. I'm going to share my screen here in just a second so you guys can see where we're starting off. It is a very, very mixed market. And you know, um, I I don't even like, I think because you do have the triple witch, um, and it's so funny because it's called, I guess it's moved to quad witching and then because there aren't futures on single name anymore, it's, tri it's triple witch, but triple witch has always been really strange. And then I think people often forget as well because commodities is driving so much of this marketplace, you do also have a few, well, specifically WTI, which is going to be affecting the oil markets quite a lot. And as a result, the oil equities. Now we've talked about this in depth and you can kind of see here um, we've got kind of a mixed bag. We've got NASDAQ up a lot, even though it was just barely trailing up before. Um, and then you've got crude trailing back up, up over the 100. And I just want to mention to you guys, I have said this before, with these massively volatile markets, you really just want to have a Christmas list of both where you'd buy and sell if you're more of an investor. If you're more of a day trader, then just have fun. You know what I mean? <laughs> Make sure that you're doing it very short dated and, and, um, and, and, and just be careful in there, quite frankly, because this is a really special market these days. Um, but, you know, it's creating massive buying opportunities and also, um, you know, really is a, a great market for the options folks out there because you can you can do a lot more strategies than you've ever been able to do. Now, Dr. Hayes joining me today. We uh, will be starting to do rooms on Clubhouse together in the coming months to just talk about how do we look, look at vol in such a volatile market and really more educational type stuff. Some of you guys might already know uh, different option structures. Some of you might be excited to learn different option structures. For me, I'm always interested in and communicating as well the the flat out hedging side for folks that are not doing pure options trading but are doing something else maybe they have a long position that they have no interest in ever letting go of because it's multi-generational in their portfolio or something like that then we should always talk about that because that was and always will be a major use of the options market um, period. So I do um, want to go through just a couple of things, but we have this amazing guest that I am so excited about, who is super duper knowledgeable, hey Wayne, um, about um, the media space. I am super thrilled to have David on the show, who will be coming shortly after me, but I do want to get through just a few things to start it off. Again, I always um, always want to remind folks, what is it that we're playing if we're intermediate at long term? And if you're a day trader, it should just be something that kind of plays in the back of your head so that you really, um, especially if you sometimes are a day trader and sometimes a swing trader, you kind of want to keep these things in your head as big overarching changes that can always uh, be thematic. We still have a massive amount of geopolitical stability, instability. And as we really even come out of, or we start to see talks coming out of um, some sort of peace discussion between the Ukraine and Russia, you do still have the whole question of how is this going to get paid for? And I think a lot of people forget this with Russia being such a heavy commodity producer and the fact that it, it does what it does, which we've gone on in some past episodes, um, you know, uh, that is not going to be as straightforward as I think a lot of folks think. It will be um, if, oh, that is a great point too. I do now post some of the older episodes in YouTube. It's um, youtube.com forward slash markets with May. If you want to review some of that, we go through a lot of macro. We do go through some more time sensitive trades, but some of them are longer dated. And I would be thrilled if you'd check out my YouTube station, um, markets with May. Uh, they are the more dated episodes if you want to do more of a subscription to it. Um, there's a link in, um, there's there's a link in a number of places. Um, 
for us for you to find it and you can always ping us and we will make sure that you get on that as well uh, but um, with that geo instability definitely a theme that we have talked about and how it might play out and for which parts of the market this supply chain has not been alleviated by it will and will not be alleviated by the end of any conflict in Europe if anything I think people still have to count out and understand the impact it will be very stock specific so to the extent that people are talking about going into a stock pickers market this is one of the reasons why and then there are just a tremendous number of long-term societal changes in behavior work from home versus not work from home how do we now think about the fact um, given that there is this conflict uh, that is always a possibility I realize my mic wasn't on, so post, hopefully this helps you hear me a bit better. <laughs> and then we've got um, we've got just the financial strength of American companies. I mean, as we had mentioned, so many had reported very strong um, uh, earnings, and then company strategies, given all the things that have happened, are going to be so foundationally important as we enter the back half of the year. Now. I always review next, next week's economic news. It turns out that really, more than any other period, we are entering a, a dead zone for news flow. So when I see this, all I think to myself is, this is going to be more of a day traders market. This isn't going to have much to do with me on the fundamental side. So this is a week for me to hopefully knock on wood, nothing else crazy happens, to just double down on my research and really think about where I want to enter and exit before the um, the uh, next, the following uh earnings season starts underway. We do have Chairman Powell speaking at the NABE conference on Monday. Now, a lot of people... Um, would typically, under traditional times, think this was nothing because last week we got so much wonderful commentary on what to expect and how to think about it. But because we're in these really tumultuous times, almost every time this man breathes, uh, the market wants to be right on top of understanding what's going on. And then on Thursday, um, we do have a series of economic data that would typically be more muted, but because I think everybody is looking for something, some little nugget, some little juicy bit to try to understand what's going on with the supply chain, this is durable goods. Um, the current account, so durable goods is going to be those like longer term purchases that folks make. Um, you've got um, the current account deficit. So that is something not to be ignored in this geopolitical instability. And then you've got PMI, the market manufacturing PMI. That's the purchasing managers index. And that will also start to give you a sense for how's it going from a company standpoint? Are they starting? to slow it down? Are they getting very worried? What are they doing to kind of um, attempt to address some of these supply side constraints? So we do have this uh, Thursday data that might be a little more important than it typically is. Let me say it that way. Usually it would be same as normal or maybe a little bit of a blip, but here I could see potentially some hedging going on on Wednesday, even if you get some um, positive or negative trending behavior in Monday and Tuesday. So just realize Thursday is going to be kind of this thing. And then you've got the Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index. That's for whatever reason, sometimes that can move. But honestly, it really shouldn't because there are other things that are far more important. OK, I do want to mention that earnings season begins April the I want to say 13th is when JP Morgan starts and the banks traditionally start reporting earnings first. That means that one by one, these companies will begin entering the quiet period. Now, I know that you guys, no matter how much I want to bring love to other parts of the marketplace, always love the tech sector. Your big cap tech, your Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, all those th all those bang stocks that we know and love that drive this market into a frenzy, those don't report till the end of April. So they still have two good solid weeks of potentially being able to say whatever they want. But the banks, which you know I watch like a hawk, um, will start entering the quiet period here shortly. And I pulled this definition up for those of you who are not familiar with the quiet period. Essentially, what happens is company management, any C-level officer and their investor relations will not be talking about what's going on with the company and with earnings. They have to be so careful about what they say. Occasionally, you'll still get an executive that just happens to be at a conference that's already booked and it's fine. But there, are, you have to really kind of navigate that news flow and almost discount it if it's definitely a company that's in the quiet period. So realize that we enter that period, and during the quiet period, 
um, analysts are still allowed to say whatever they want. So sometimes they will, they will say different things, uh, provided they're not um, otherwise uh, denied from doing so for other reasons. But that can always be a very fun period for day traders and an opportunity for investors. So um, definitely have that hit list of stuff that you might be interested in. Now, I, last thing I'm gonna go through before I turn it over to our awesome special guest is FedEx's earnings they reported yesterday after the close and they are getting pummeled today but honestly it wasn't that bad of an earnings report if anything given how crazy um you know energy's been trading i was actually slightly impressed now i'm not in this name so maybe that's why i'm impressed um but i just want to show you that the fourth quarter for them by the way represents december so you get a little bit of christmas then you get january february and then we get the numbers that come out here and U.S. numbers were actually up 30% on, on revenue, okay? So we do have some price increases that are happening there. Um, international domestic, which means just there are businesses that are overseas that look like the United States business. That was up very strong, which is really great for them. And then their export business, which is other companies sending it around the world, that was up 41%. Interestingly, freight was only up 17%. And that's interesting because there's all this conjecture all the time on who's shipping what via plane to try to make up for this expense or that port delay or what have you. But that was 17%. I think it's likely because last year it was so strong. So it might be that. But the one thing that I watched very closely, um, you know, that I'm kind of curious, it's always a curiosity for me, curiosity for me is this fuel expense. Now, it was up 86% fourth quarter to fourth quarter. But I really want to show you this, and that is the third quarter, second quarter, first quarter, like the previous quarter's numbers were really just more or less at the same place. And I'm not sure if that was because they hedged using the, the back part of the curve or what have you. And I had not really, in fairness to the rest of the world, as far as that might have already considered this, fully thought about how our thematic about the front end, the spot price being up here and the back end being down here at, um, might impact as that dynamic changes and we start to get it coming flatter, still definitely in backwardation where the spot price is much higher than the price that's out three, six, whatever, a year out. But if you're hedging and you're hedging like a company of this nature, um, what do you do or what does that look like in the subsequent quarters? where we've had these exogenous shocks that have absolutely dragged up the back part of the curve. And it's, it's a very fascinating thing because that dynamic, I think, will create a bit of uncertainty to folks that are doing their um, fundamental analysis because it could just be, um, you know, really bad luck on the part of the company for how they roll their hedges um, and, and the such. Um, and, you know, as we have been saying with respect to the oil and gas space, that backwardation is really a hot mess, for lack of a better way to describe it. We need the back part of the curve to increase enough to where there is a desire to do investment. And we kind of talked about this earlier in the week where with um, oil having spiked, here's the WTI physical contract, which is a physical contract. We saw that um, if you were a company, you could have hedged it out at 112, not even at the high of 128 and locked in that price for selling. Um, and if you were someone else, you might have hedged over here and then just waited and got it down, but you're still at 93, which is remarkably quite a bit higher than what it would have been last quarter. So it, it it's a really bizarre dynamic. This is absolutely enough volume for an energy company. So EOG might do like 3 billion barrels in reserves or something so they could hedge this out pretty easily. Do you know what I mean? So this is totally enough volume for those for the for there to be dispersion between the commodity and the equity. But also from a corporate perspective, these wide swings can make it very hard if you're an analyst to figure out how much did fuel cost this quarter? Do you know? So I just wanna just wanna point that out. Um, we'll see if there's more news flow on that as we go through the next couple months. But I would definitely think the volatility should be um, still really fun for options players alike. And then I will stop sharing. And I'm super excited about our guest, David. How are you, David? I'm doing fine. How are you doing, May? 
I am great. And you're coming to us from the West Coast. I'm on the East Coast. So we really got some yep. good cross the across the U.S. representation. Um, you, you guys, David is an amazing entrepreneur plus an amazingly knowledgeable person about the media space. David, can you give us a little bit of, of your background to start out? Yeah, so um, I guess I guess I'll kind of start at the beginning. So um, uh, I went to University of California, Berkeley, UC Berkeley or Cal for short. I uh, studied business as undergrad. Uh, I went into investment banking for a very, very short period of time. I uh, went back to school, decided to go ahead and go ahead and get my graduate degree in economics, right? Uh, because I just didn't want to do investment banking. It's just too terrible. I couldn't handle it. I couldn't right? understand so, why. Yeah, I can understand. I just couldn't handle Dark it. Dark side. Uh, yeah. And uh, while I was working on my graduate degree, uh, I came up with an idea and concept uh, for uh, AM Publishing, uh, my startup, which focuses on producing media content. Uh, uh, and uh, the very first brand we ever launched was Man of the Hour, which is more of a men's lifestyle platform. Uh, the second platform that we launched was Somedam, which is for women, right? So that's French for woman rising. We were trying to represent this idea of the millennial woman and now Gen Z woman who is rising and they're sort of coming into their own, rising out there being professional women and wanting to kick ass and take names later. Then we brought in our third platform, which is Modern Treatise, where we focus on politics, a little bit of economics, a little bit of what's going on uh, in the politics world on the international level. Uh, then we decided to bring in Serialized TV, which focuses on um, a niche audience of fans of the uh, of the international world of soaps, and then lastly, we brought in the platform. I always say these days is my uh, most favorite is a hot set where we focus on people of color in the entertainment industry from the business side of entertainment. Right, so we're looking at what's happening in the in the entertainment industry, but we're looking at it from what's going on behind the curtain, what's going on behind the scenes. You know, uh, how the sausage is made. Uh, what are the deals going on? What is happening? What's what's happening in this ever-changing uh, media world? So whether we're talking about, at least not with a hot set, but just overall, whether you're talking about what's happening in the magazine industry, I know a lot about what's happening in that world, in the publishing world, but also what is happening in the, you know, in the media industry and in television and streaming, you know, uh, and film. What is all, what's all this changing? Because it's a big media landscape and there are a whole lot of changes that are continuing to happen that are going to really affect the foreseeable future, particularly for people who probably want to be invested in like things such as say CBS Corp, right? You know, or you know, or they want to get invested in Disney or NBC Universal, right? No, so there's a lot of things happening. So that's a little bit of my background. I think that's amazing. And just for those of you who are trying desperately to write down all of the amazing pieces of media that David has, we will absolutely make sure that that's all available on the Discord for subscribers. And also, uh, once we do put out um, our wonderful special guests series on YouTube, we will have it down below. And I absolutely encourage you guys, this guy is super stylish in those pieces of media, as well as they're just really amazing articles. They definitely highlight minorities which I think we are becoming a bigger presence within the business world. So absolutely, please, please, please check that stuff out. You will be thrilled and excited by what you see. Um, and I wanted to first ask you to kick things off a bit. You know, we had a lot of conversations about what's going on in media and how, mm -hmm. and you know, a lot of folks are still trying to learn this space as investors. Talk, I think what I thought was really wonderful is how you clearly articulated what is it that the media companies are thinking nowadays as they're thinking about profitability, new shows, how do they, how is that landscape continued to transform? I loved what you had to say about that the other day. Well, yeah, so there are a lot of changes happening. You understand that broadcast television, or those who don't understand, there's a difference between broadcast, cable, and streaming. Broadcast are those four or five channels that you get for free. You can just plug your TV in, CBS, NBC, ABC, cables like BET, you know, MTV, and you're streaming, you know, with your Netflix, your Hulu, your Prime, your stuff like that. So in this sort of, we're, we've entered into, at least uh, for, we'll broadly call it television content, we've entered into what is considered the second golden age of television, right? Which means there's just, a, there's a lot of content out there uh, and there's more and more, good content coming out, right? So one of the things that you're finding finding out is that people are competing and having bidding wars, right? This is part of part of the market now is to have bidding wars over trying to get the, the best content producers to create the kinds of content that can bring in large audiences as well as bring in niche audiences, right? It used to be a time period where people didn't really care about like 
uh, let's say this little niche black audience over here, right? You know, that they stopped caring about them, say, you know, post the post the nineties, right? They didn't really give a care about them, but now they care about them. So for example, I'll give you guys a great example. Uh, there was a big bidding war over the reboot of the Fresh Prince of Bel Air, which is now called Bel Air. You had HBO Max, you had Netflix, and you had Peacock all bidding. I mean, they were battling to get this show, right? Peacock obviously ended up winning out. And so why did Peacock win out? Because one of the one of the issues that a lot of content creators are having today is ownership, right? A lot of these media outlets are not allowing as much ownership uh, from the content creator in the stuff that they're creating. And so the uh, you know, corporation that's going to allow that to happen. And Peacock really gave, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, Will Smith and his fellow producers a whole lot of control over the content. They decided I'm going to go with them. So what that Netflix can put out, you know, the, you know, could write a big check, right? So what that, you know, HBO Max has a more well-known guaranteed audience, right? They want to go to the space where they're going to have much more control, right? So what is happening in this sort of changing market here is, Who's coming up with the best kinds of content, right? Uh, where does that content fit at, right? And how does that content above all of the other content fit into the overall portfolio, right, of these corporations? So uh, you might have noticed that uh, uh, CBS Corp launched uh, Peacock, right? So Peacock is a streaming app. Uh, it is their answer to Netflix. It's their answer to uh, uh you know, uh, a Paramount Plus, right? Paramount Plus is their, is their answer to yeah. Peacock, is their answer to all the other ones, right? What their strategy is, is you have to understand that CBS Corp also owns, um, what is it called, Viacom, right? They bought Viacom, right? So what they're doing is they're taking programs from across the different media platforms that they're having, and they're deciding which ones they want to exclusively air on uh, the Paramount Plus app and which ones they want to allow to be aired on these sort of individual uh, apps or platforms for the various kinds of media outlets that they work. So for instance, uh, The Game, right? A show that originally aired on UPN, uh, they tried to get it on the CW when that, when that network was being formed, but it didn't. Two years later, they ended up on BET and they ended, ended up when they were on BET, they ended up breaking a groundbreaking debut for the for the reboot of that first reboot of the show is that they had the highest rated reboot or not wow. reboot so the, high, the highest rated premiere of a tv show at all of cable right which was about like a little over five to seven million viewers right that was a big deal right right and so then when the show ended after its 10th season obviously uh cbs corp decided that they wanted to reboot the show again and so people thought well it's going to go on the bet plus app right right but they said no 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 we want to take that show, The Game, and we're going to put it on Paramount Plus, right? Because they looked at The Game saying, this series has a guaranteed audience, right? It was created by Mara Brock Hill, right? She's got a guaranteed audience base, right? They don't think that it needs to be simply put on B BET Plus because the, the series stars a majority black cast. They said, no, 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 no. We're going we're, we're gonna to put it as one of the sort of marquee television programs on mm -hmm. the Paramount Plus app, and it's done successful, right? Right. Mm -hmm. It's done well. So uh, the ways in which they're going about gathering content uh, is really, really important. The other thing is, and this is something that I always want to mention about Netflix. Netflix is you can't beat Netflix in terms of the volume of your volume of content. You can't. Right. Yeah. You can't do that. But People Netflix. Is, yeah, yes, yes, they do. They can't. You can't beat them on that. But here's where you can beat them at. You can beat them on the quality of content. Right. One thing that has happened is while Netflix has a short volume of content, the quality of content on Netflix is starting to decline, right? right? That, and, and so uh, in order for that to change, that means Netflix has to get a lot better with trying to select its content creators and putting out the kinds of content. But this does give an opening for HBO Max, which I can tell you HBO Max, there's hardly any program on there that isn't high quality content, right? right? So, they're, so they're really winning, winning in that area of being high quality content. So for Paramount Plus, for uh, Peacock, for all these other apps, they have an opportunity to, to increase their own market share in this regard in terms of like, you know, subscriber rates, subscription rates. Number one, by focusing on creating much more quality content. The other thing that is important too, and you might notice this, is the sort of tiered system that they're, that they're implementing uh, across the apps in order for uh, subscribers to come in. So when you look at Peacock, when you look at Peacock, when you look at Hulu, for instance, which is owned by Disney, right? And uh, they have an ad an ad tier, which is very cheap, and then they have an ad free tier, right? right? And so, you know, a lot more people are actually using the ad tier, right? Which is perfect for them, right? right? 
right? You know, they're perfect. Few people are going to pay that extra five or ten dollars or seven dollars it is to not have no ads, right? So it really works for them because in this uh, in this age where broadcast is dying, right? And broadcast is, is it's been held up by advertising, right? These sort of ad rates. And now they're moving over to streaming platforms. You know, they still have to find a way to, to figure out how do I engage the advertiser, right? And how does the advertiser be able to engage uh, potential uh, uh, current customers and future customers, right? Because the advertiser is not going for your grandma. They're not going for the mother. They're trying to get this younger demographic. And one thing I always want people out there to know, one of the things that advertisers do is that advertisers are always trying to create the new long-term customer. So the, in, the, in the advertising world, they believe that once you hit about like 37, 38 years old, you're going to be set in your ways, right? You know what kind of laundry detergent you're going to buy. You know what kind of car you're going to get. You know what kind of new washing machine you're going to get. So they're always trying to attract this younger, uh, a newer customer who has not yet made that decision, who due to economics, right? They don't have a lot of money yet, right? Due to the not yet being sold by a particular brand, maybe Nike is one of those companies that, yeah, you can sell people on at a very young age and they'll stick to it. But other than that, they're having an opportunity to reach out to these new potential customers and make them long term, long term customers. So they're seeking what outlets can they get on to uh, get in front of this sort of millennial, to get in front of now the Gen Z customer, right? And so they're finding that streaming platforms are the greatest way to move in terms of being able to put their ads out there. Uh, and potentially uh, uh, get that customer to tune in, right? So uh, the the most the best early adopters to this, you're seeing a lot of sort of like the the, the sort of financial tech apps, like I've seen uh, Vimeo ads, right? You know, you know, uh, uh, I've seen ads for like a Cash App, right? I'm seeing ads for investor apps. I'm seeing ads for all kinds of whole 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 host of different products and services out there that are attempting to reach a younger audience. So. It is, it is very clear that streaming is going to be the wave of the future. But then what happens to broadcast? Like these broadcast networks aren't going to necessarily disappear and they're still going to have to play in the market somehow. So what they're, what I'm looking at, and I'm going to say this, that in about at least, I'm going to give it about another 30 years, right? So in about another 30 years, U.S. broadcast TV is going to be like British broadcast television, where in the daytime, it's going to be mainly lifestyle programming, some talk shows, things that you don't have to spend a lot of money, right? Like for instance, it, does, it, it costs you less than half a million dollars a year to keep to maintain a set for the view, right? right? The, you know, the big expenditure comes in and how much you're paying for, you know, Whoopi Goldberg to be one of the hosts, four or five million dollars a year or any other, other people. That's all you're really paying for, right? right? You're just paying for them. And so what that means is that when, when, when they start negotiating ad rates, right? right? With them, you know, quarterly ad rates, right? Then you're going to be the, you know, Disney's going to be making more, right, in terms of for its money. And then uh, uh, that, that, that ends up ultimately boding well for Disney in terms of uh, how much revenue can get in and ultimately the profits it is going to get from that revenue, right? Whereas a lot of the, the scripted programming that used to come on in the daytime, such as your daytime soap operas, you see there are only four now, right? Uh, CBS yeah. has two. Uh, NBC has one. Uh, ABC has one. Those are the only programs that they have left that are scripted in the daytime because it's just too expensive, right? And when and when you have sagging, uh, uh, you know, ratings for these programs, right? That's going to cut into how much they can uh, charge advertisers for ad spots uh, doing these programs. So one of the major things people just have to realize is that in this changing world, this is where like lifestyle programming, reality TV programming becomes really, 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 really important. The cheap to produce programming and still get you the same amount of ratings as you could for a daytime soap opera, right? I think the currently the highest rated show in daytime, uh, at least one of the, one of the four soap operas is Young and the Rest, is they're getting about an average of 3.5 million viewers, right? That's not a lot from the days when they were getting about 18, 19, 20 million, right? Way back in its heyday, right? So, so now me, that you're at me, here. Let yeah. me summarize some of what you're saying here. So, so yeah. broadcast, you think still has about 30 years on it, potentially, mm -hmm. but it's really a wind down more than anything. And it's yeah, yeah. really going to all be streaming at this point, and that's the transition. Mm -hmm. Now, among mm -hmm. the streaming guys, who do you think is actually doing the best job right now? It sounded like you're saying Netflix, you're starting to be a little bit concerned with the quality mm -hmm. of their programming, or how are you thinking about it exactly? So, you again, you can't beat Netflix and subscribers, right? right. Netflix yeah. has got to, you can't beat them in subscribers. They're about, I think it's about 220 
uh, it'll you know simply changes every month or so you get a new yeah, idea really the, the last the last statistics were about close to about 225 million viewers worldwide wow. right that's worldwide wow. right uh and netflix's strategy is to basically franchise itself into different markets right right so that's their growth strategy because they've already saturated the u.s market right they've saturated the uk or australia um they, they've even pretty much getting close to saturating you know south korea right uh, and so yeah. Japan, uh, even in China, right? You know, uh, uh, so so their real growth well, China, is China. I think a little more, bit less. I think you're yeah, thinking more uh, like Taiwan yeah, and yeah, Hong Kong. Taiwan, 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 Hong Kong. Yeah, 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 yeah. A little bit more <laughs> less. Yeah, yeah. So they want to further expand the Latin American markets. Uh, uh, they're going to further expand into European markets, and they're starting to invest more in expanding into the African market, right? Which is which is yeah. really the kind of the last of the Mohicans for them. But they haven't made that much that much expenditure for everyone, uh, to be honest. for everyone for everyone to be honest there <laughs> so but at the same time once you've already saturated the market right and the only way that you can grow this to expand to into other markets again that gives an opening for these sort of other streaming streaming platforms to really make some kind of growth right so i'm going to say that netflix is number one right right at this present yeah. moment but it's long term that you know long term when you're thinking about netflix it's going to be about quality content right the quality of the content and the other issue that people don't think is necessarily an issue yet but it's going to become an issue is ownership right it is the big issue with them right it's ownership so um, uh what, what michaela cole who had the emmy winning i may may i may destroy you right which got tons of you know press it was really big uh, she went to Netflix and Netflix wanted to actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, have gained the rights to, you know, produce the show, right? But they wouldn't give her any ownership, right? And she made a big stink about that in the media, that they wouldn't give her any ownership. So she went to HBO Max where she got it. So I think one of the big issues Netflix is going to come up with is that how much ownership are they going to allow their content creators, right? To have in their projects. And Netflix's strategy is unless you're like as big as Shonda Rhimes, who's obviously quite a success, right? Right? Or any other big producers. Oh, so good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got yes, a question. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Go we, ahead. we got a question from Richard. Richard, go ahead. So thanks for this presentation. This is actually really, really incredible. So I'm, I'm a baby boomer, right? So let me just put that out there. And <laughs> we have broadcast TV. But the only reason we have broadcast TV is because my in-laws live with us. So mm -hmm. we have broadcast TV, we have cable, every channel, mm -hmm. we have every streaming mm -hmm. service known to man. So mm -hmm. whenever my in-laws are watching TV, my wife and I are sitting on the sofa on our phones and she's watching something, I'm watching something else. But my question really has to do with Apple. So you uh -huh. talked about quality content. Mm -hmm. I've noticed, and it may just be me, that the content that Apple is producing is extremely, uh, uh, I mean, the quality is, is great. I mean, they just produce some really great shows. Mm -hmm. How are they positioned? And I asked a question because I bought an Apple TV years ago. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I have probably, I don't know, three, 400 movies. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not going to buy any movies on Amazon, right? Just mm -hmm. because my platform's Apple. So mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. going to stick with Apple no matter what. But where mm -hmm. are they in the streaming uh, war? I mean, are they are they coming up? Are they going to sort of improve? Are they going to be competitive? Uh, I just have a question just to kind of figure out from the whole Apple investment thing generally where they stand. OK, so this is what I would say about Apple. Apple is what I what is what I would say is slowly but surely on the come up, right? Obviously, when they decided to launch this sort of you know you know Apple TV Plus idea, they didn't know what the hell they were doing, right? Right? This was just you know the market is down in terms of you know smartphones and you know uh, laptops and other things. We've got to do something new to kind of you know to kind of get you know investors' interest up, right? To kind of stoke some kind of press and attention out there and they decided to jump into it so the immediate jump into apple tv plus when it started out it wasn't that great right it was like, eh, you know you know there was about one program on there you could kind of say it as eh, like people really cared about but i think what has happened is that over over a period of time what they've really been doing is that they've been investing and in trying to uh, create and acquire so there's a little bit of acquisition so some of it is acquiring movies such as uh if you haven't seen the movie, and I suggest people see this, you know, uh, the tragedy of Macbeth, right? That was something that Apple produced, right? You know, or you know, and it's very good. And they actually showed it in the theaters before they actually put it on the app. So what I'm going to say with them is that 
they're not yet in the position to be competing against Netflix or, mm. or uh, Amazon Prime or to be competing against HBO Max yet. But I want to tell you that they're slowly but surely starting to creep up, right? They're a slow creeper. So you should keep them, right? Because, because the, they understand that it's quality more so than quantity, which is, which is really good. And the quality of the content, not only does it give them more media press, give them more attention, but it also has the potential to entice more people to sign up and become subscribers of Apple TV+. Plus. So I think that uh, they're just on the come up. They're, they're not there yet, but just watch out. I say give them another uh, five, if 10 years at the most, and you know they'll be, they'll be one of the top five competitors. Yeah, they did the Microsoft thing. So they gave away mm -hmm. Apple TV Plus for free, mm -hmm. essentially, mm -hmm. just to kind of get people hooked on it. And mm -hmm. you're right, in the beginning, the content was not that great. But mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's the movies that they produce, like the Tom mm -hmm. Hanks movie, I guess the war yep. movie, I don't even remember mm -hmm. the name. It was yeah. really great stuff. And some of the series is that they do, and particularly the Black uh, mm -hmm. the, the African-American or Black series that they put together mm -hmm. are just high quality. So Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And always remember, like for some of these streaming platforms, if you can't compete in the volume of content that, that's out there, you sure can compete in the quality of the content. So that's always a strategy. I want to give some other people, I have a million questions for you, David, as mm -hmm. per usual, but like, I want to give some other people, is there anyone else that has a question um, that they want to ask and make sure they get in? Hey, may I do, please, David. Hey, David, thank you. Are you in Berkeley? Thank uh, no, I'm actually in San Francisco. Okay, yeah, okay. I'm in Los Gatos. I, you mm -hmm. have on a coat, I have on a t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask you uh, about um, broadcast news like CNNs. Mm -hmm. where, okay. where are they going to have a place in this? Okay, okay. So, um, so when you think about like CNN, MSNBC, Fox, and that's on cable, that's not broadcast, that's cable, but I know what you mean. Right, right. Well, so here's what's happening. So CNN has created an app called CNN uh, Plus. I don't know if you've heard of it, but they're launching this app uh, uh, pretty soon, right? Uh, uh, this is this is their way of trying to get into uh, the streaming market, right? Because as you know, uh, cable news uh, numbers are down. Right? Right. Fewer and fewer people are getting their news from cable news. And, and in fact, when you start looking at the data in terms of age, right, the average age of a person who's watching those uh, three cable networks, the, it, about 10 years ago, it was about 57. Now it's about 69, right? <laughs> so, so, so they're really surviving on a hook and hook largely by a very older boomer demographic of people who still watch news and media through a much more traditional format. Uh, and so younger people like myself as a millennial, people who are Gen Z, and even many of the Gen Xers, they're going to YouTube, right? They're, the YouTubers are giving them better news and better commentary about what's going on in the world today. They're listening to podcasts. They're going to these areas. So uh, what is going to happen to these uh, cable news outlets is that they're all going to be investing in getting into the streaming world. And they do have a benefit because they already have the, uh, the money, right? They already have the resources to be able to go out there and do that. But then here is the problem that they come up with. The problem is you're trying to reach a younger demographic. And I'm going to be frankly honest with you, putting Don Lemon, which they've already uh, give, given him a show, putting Don Lemon on CNN Plus is not going to attract a younger viewer, right? It isn't. Right? It's, not, it's, not, it's not going to engage a younger audience. It's really about the ways in which you engage, engage content, news content. So let me tell you what the typical millennial and Gen Z are like when they're looking for news content. This is who, this is who these platforms are going to go after. They want a person who has a point of view, a perspective, right? They want to know what your point of view and perspective is when they watch your show. So they want to know that when they watch a Ben Shapiro, right? They know that he is someone who's a little bit more conservative and that he comes from that particular perspective. They don't care whether they agree or disagree with him. He's honest and he's open about this is where he stands at. That's the perspective that they're going to get, right? They want to see that. They want to know that if they're going to the Young Turks, right? You know, which, you know, leans more to the left, right? You know, with, you know, uh, uh, with its two hosts, that they're going to be getting a left-leaning perspective, right? So they want to know your biases or your political leanings up front, and then they want you to give give your opinion on the news of the day. Now, pretty much the cable news outlets have been giving their opinions on the news of the day, although a lot of them tend to pretend like they're kind of telling you, well, I'm, I'm just really telling you factually what's happening. But that's just not attractive to, uh, you know, to the younger consumer. So it's going to really be about that. It's going to really be about having a point of view uh, and presenting that point of view, right? And then you can still have some news hours in which you're just trying to present 
are trying to present without any bias what is happening in the world today. But the days in which people are going to be spending their time waiting for 6 p.m. for, you know, uh, you know, some news host to come on and tell them what's happening in the world, it's just not going to exist anymore. And another big example of this is people might know this is that before the rise of like the internet, right? People used to tune in on broadcast channels on Sundays, right? To get the Sunday morning political roundup, right? You know, they used to tune in for that hour each Sunday to find out, you know, what the what the the experts and the commentators on either side of the political aisle were saying on on, on, on each side, right? Right? You used to get that. Nobody cares about that anymore because you've already got the news on Twitter, you know, three minutes after it's, after the event is happening or as it's unfolding, right? So uh I do believe that those outlets will still exist, right? You know, in some kind of hybrid form, right? But a large portion of the content is going to be focused more on what can we do on the streaming platforms. And CNN Plus is the biggest example of that of that coming out. The other thing I'll say, which everybody knows, is uh, part of the reason uh, uh, that you know Jeff Zucker, you know, exited CNN aside from the fact that you know the whole quasi scandal around his, uh, you know what people might consider inappropriate professional relationship happening on the scenes is that the actual owner, you know, of CNN, right, did not really like him and wanted him out because he wanted to do something very different with the network, right? And so now, now that Jeff Zucker is out, now they have the opportunity to do exactly what they wanted to do, which is in part to transition into more streaming content, right? And, uh, I would say within the within the coming within the coming months, I may even say within the coming year or so, you're going to be seeing a lot of the kinds of uh, anchors who have been anchoring their own programming on CNN Plus disappear uh, 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 as their contracts are not going to be renewed right anymore for some of them, and some of them are just going to be slowly but surely transitioned over to CNN Plus, MSNBC, Fox. I don't know what Fox is going to do. So far, Fox hasn't really done too much investing uh, in the online world, which if they want to stick around, they need to invest in getting into the streaming world. Uh, MSNBC hasn't, has not yet made a solid investment in getting into the streaming world in, in that regard, right? They just, they just haven't done it yet. I don't know how they're going to get there. But the overall ratings for, uh, for, the, for the three platforms is down dramatically. And CNN just kind of really, really plateauing out being the worst of them all at this present moment. So... Yeah, I would just say that it's going to be uh, streaming media. This is going to be the place where things are going to happen, even for the news. So the best example of this, I think that is also doing good is CBSN, right? If you've seen that, uh, CBSN, which is its own streaming platform, they are having uh, younger hosts uh, producing news programs. And although they don't have a particular opinion and they're not presenting opinions or points of views, they are really seriously trying to report what is happening on a domestic level and international level in a 24-hour fashion on a news app. So... Uh, that would be my answer to that, at least for right now. David, Thank I want to sneak one in there really quick because because this streaming thing, it's always really <laughs> fascinating to me because no one ever really, well, I shouldn't say no one, but very few people will include Google streaming in, or I'm sorry, mm -hmm. YouTube streaming in there. Um, mm -hmm. And so many of these networks actually stream on YouTube. How should we even think about that? Are we going to see less of that? What are, you, what are you already kind of hearing in the whispers of your world? Well, okay, so so... So actually, this is a this is an interesting interesting question because you are seeing CNN putting clips up on YouTube. You are seeing MSNBC doing that, right? Well, they first started to get engaged in that because they realized it was a way to kind of generate free press, right? Right? It was a way to generate interest, right? If you put up a clip, uh, CNN would do this thing where they would put up like maybe uh, a minute and a half of a long interview or a two three minute clip using the most salacious part of it. They use a tabloid style to try to engage it. Uh, MSNBC would put up segments. They might put up a small little seven-minute seven interview or five-minute interview out of, a, out of a show. Uh, and they were using that as just as a way to extendedly engage people to get people interested in the network and wanting to come to see that now. So the question is, yeah, as they engage in streaming platforms, will they still be putting content up there? Yes, they still will, still will be putting content up there. They'll still be putting clips of content up there. They'll still be putting segments of content up there because it's just basically free promotion. But the biggest thing that these cable news outlets have when it comes to YouTube, and this is the big, big deal, because this is where the real war is happening. It's a war against independent content creators. Oh, they are livid at the independent content creators who are usurping them, right? 
they, they, you know, I mentioned Ben Shapiro. He's a big time conservative, you know, commentator. Millennials know him, Gen Z know him. Whether you agree with him or don't agree with his politics, you know who he is, you know he has a point of review. And when you start to look at like, you know, uh, uh, you know, the Daily Wire, which, you know, hosts uh, his program, you know, their YouTube channel is doing, you know, leaps and bounds in terms of numbers, right? You're having at, you know, like I said, the, the Young Turks was considered one of the most successful people outside of the, the now no longer existing Alex Jones, right? You know, in terms of their ability to produce content, right? So who they're really now competing against is they're, is they're competing against the people they never thought they'd had to compete against, the nobodies, right? Mm -hmm. The people who don't have the money behind them to back them up, the people who just built, who just like got markets themselves with May, money. like markets my, with my, May, with markets with May, right? Subscribe to my station, guys. Right, 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 right. So that's who they're really, that's who they're really competing against, right? Because yeah. so much time is spent by millennials, so much time is spent by Gen Z, and I would even say by default, uh, uh, Gen X was on YouTube looking at various different kinds of content, right? It's it's almost it's almost like the kind of thing where. You've, you've, you've got a drag queen who does makeup on celebrities who gets more views, you know, and has more subscribers than CNN does, right? You know, that's Crazy. what's going on, right? You know, they're competing against those individuals. So, so their biggest competition is going to be uh, with, the, with basically the other YouTubers, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and if they were smart, right? If they were doing it in the right way, they would try to get contracts with those people to acquire them, to bring them onto their platforms, right? You know, so that they could then kind of say, let's see if we can get some of their subscriber base in, right? By letting them be who they are. But see, the problem is, and this is just the problem we have to realize, a lot of times what happens is that corporate media outlets, when they come in and they try to acquire these little independent content creators, what they do is they get them in there and then they take out the essence of who they are. They try to mold them into what they want them to be. And then that loses, then everything that made them popular is no longer there anymore. All of a sudden, you can't be posting on YouTube anymore. No clips anymore, all of a sudden whatever it is about you that made you who you would have made people tune in to hear the news from you to hear your point of view is taken away because they want to make you more polished in this sort of old 20th century style of a you know of a, of a news reporter or an anchor right so there you go so that still has to be thought we've got time for one more question guys or do i get it or what do you guys all right Last question then, what is your favorite media stock? Let's just actually get to brass tacks. We are a market show. Do you have one that you just love and you're like, I'm, you know, I'd like to do it. Like I'm, I'm actively interested now. Or do you have one that you're like, listen, I'm never letting go of this girl. So you tell me how to hedge it, but I'm definitely not letting go. <laughs> you know You know what? I'm going to say Disney, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to. I'm just, David I'm loves just, that too, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say Disney because it came down to me: is it, is it CBS Corp, right, or is it Disney, right? Which one of those two? Right? The CBS yeah. Corp is, is it Disney. Viacom, just, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. CBS Viacom. Viacom. CBS yeah. Viacom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. CBS yeah. Viacom thing. And I keep going with Disney, and I'm gonna say it's Disney because of Marvel. You know, you know, it's because of Marvel. Marvel is just, mm. you know, you know, Marvel is like landing a gold mine where you're just digging and digging and digging and digging and there's just more gold coming out of it right right yeah, so uh, you know the content yeah the content is great you see how well the movies do at the theaters right right even movies that are not as successful do a hell of a lot better than say yeah. you know things that Warner Brothers is doing with DC right you know that is successful right so I think it is the MCU universe that I think in part I'm not think, I'm not saying in, it's entirely what's holding up Disney right because they do their own movies you know their own classic yeah. Disney kind of movie types of things but I do think Marvel is just it, it, it is just that sort of engine that just keeps on running right so I would say get with you know get with uh, get with Disney because of Marvel right now I don't see Marvel slowing down anytime soon and because they've allowed, I mean, you have people working in here, you know, create, coming up with the scripts, coming up with the story ideas based on the comic books. And they are really, really, really thinking about the, uh, the original fan base, right? The comic book folk and, and how they can also bring in this audience of people who knows nothing about it. Like I grew up as a comic book fan, right? I grew up reading the X-Men, the Alpha Flight, you know, you know, Spider-Man, all these kind of things. So I kind of know this sort of MCU universe very well. And they've just done a great job of creating this sort of broad universe in which they can incorporate and spin off different movies and different films uh, that are going to really draw in large audiences. And let's not put it out there that not only did they do very successful with Black Panther, right? Uh, but even in the pandemic, they really, they, they really, they really did well with Shang Chi, right? You know, right? You know, and, and so, and I always give this 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 little note. Technically speaking, 
by the way, uh, box office standards would be shang Chi should have been considered a failure because of the, you know, you need to make three to four times more than your total budget. But given that it was the pandemic, right? It was a massive success in the regards that it made it more than, you know, what, you know, close to $500 million despite, you know, you know, you know, not really having all the theaters opened up and doing that. So it did actually extremely well. So you have to keep looking at the MCU, right? And thinking about Disney in terms of the MCU. Now, in 20 years, if the MCU starts to flare out, you know, and, and it's not really doing good anymore, then you might start to back back. But I'm thinking that that MCU for right now is keeping them going. And the way they keep plotting and planning movie after movie after movie, being releasing three or four movies in a year from the MCU, and they're all seemingly bringing in money, you need to keep your eyeball on that. And that's going to be really the drive for them. So. Okay, I lied. I have one more question because I know right. I got too many watchers that actually care on this. Can you say a little something about AMC or you refuse to comment on AMC, the most <laughs> crazy stock of them all? <laughs> um, uh, let, let me, what, 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 what I want to say about AMC. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm going to say uh, this. Is, uh, I'm going to make an overall statement about the uh, about the world okay, of theater, okay. right? 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 Because I, because because I've been having conversations with this on Clubhouse with people in various different rooms. Uh, yeah, people are passionate, right? right? People are passionate <laughs> okay. about. Look, there there are there are two there are, there are two sides to this, right? There is what I call the old sort of conservative media side that believes everybody should go to the theater and watch films, and this is the way you should do it. You know, and we should be promoting people getting out there to do it, and the streaming thing was just a temporary, you know, a detour because of the pandemic and all that. But then there's the other side that says it's just time to get with the times, right? 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 Yeah. People. You know, once people started being able to stream movies, they're not going to really go back to this old sort of traditional, you know, traditional way of going to the theaters. So I have this idea what I see the future of, of the theater experience being. The theater experience has to be more than just going and buying popcorn, you know, and, you know, for $20 and, and a drink to go watch a movie for an hour or two hours. Right? It has to be an experience. And then that means that the theater has to be, uh, there won't there won't be as many theater locations as we're used to, right? You won't have a, like, you know, like a, a city of like 700,000 people is not gonna have like eight or nine different, you know, big times, you know, theaters, you know, chains there. They're gonna have maybe a few, a, a fewer theaters, but they're gonna make it more of an event, right? So you're gonna have games there. You're gonna have other activities people can do. You're gonna have a bar at the theater so people can drink, you know, after or beforehand. And, and, that, and that the types of movies that are gonna largely be put in a lot of these theaters are gonna be these sort of event movies, right? This is why like an MCU movie can sell out at theaters and it'll get to the point, I've seen it happen here in the Bay Area where sometimes you'll have three theaters here in the same movie at once, right? right? Because that's how, how, that's how much interest generates. So I think mm -hmm. that if anything, if we're thinking about AMC and if we're thinking about, you know, you know, you know what the future holds, I was probably not very good to invest in AMC, right? I was going to say that it's probably not a very good investment because 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 the whole theater world is place going. to invest. The price is important right. always. The, <laughs> the price, company right, dynamics is yeah. one thing, and then the yeah. price. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> the price is very very different. Like Bob Barker, but, the price has to be right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The price has to be right, but the but the whole theater world is going through it's going through an entire upheaval. When I've seen theaters closing down around me, right? I mean, these independent yeah. theaters. AMC was among the companies buying up these little independent theaters, right? Still let them be independent, but they're, they're buying them up. I'm, I tell people all the time, you go to these theaters and you're going to see what they make be called academy kinds of films. And it's like 20 people in a, in a theater that can, you know, in a theater that can see like maybe like three, four, 500 people, right? And it's mainly like grandmas, you know, retired folks, right? Who want to go see it. I said, this is not what a, what a theater makes. But then when I go and I see those films that are like the MCU film, right? You know? That's where you're here, like you stand the room only, you know, you're going to have to wait three weeks just to get a ticket. You got to do this. So I think it's going to become much more of an experience. And until uh, uh, AMC and, you know, other owners of theaters kind of figure out how to recalibrate and refocus the theater experience to being an experience, uh, I don't think it's a good thing to invest in. But once they start to, uh, to, show, to show that they understand that they need to change to come with the modern time, then you got something. Yeah, so that's what to look out for. And I, I think that's probably a great point when you're trying to do your due diligence on stocks and you're trying to understand 
where the trend is going. It's amazing to have you on the show, David, because you're giving, for me, you definitely gave me a lot of vision about how to think about the space and what to kind of look for when I'm trying to figure out, ooh, is that the next thing that I want to put in my portfolio? Well, we have actually hit our time limit for day. Thank you so much, David. We're definitely going to try to have you on again at some point. And thank you guys for viewing. Um, until next time, you guys, be careful in the marketplace.